Are you going to see the record button again, probably? Okay, so beekeeping equipment basics. Um, cover the, what I think is necessary. This information is geared towards hopefully the hobby or the novice beekeeper. It's not going to be adequate for somebody who is wanting to be a commercial beekeeper, although the equipment is pretty much the same, but um, that's what I try to gear it towards. So get started here. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> Um, early beekeepers used a variety of ways to keep bees. Uh, the pictures on the left are what's called a bee skep. They were woven straw or twisted sticks that were often covered in mud or sometimes dung for rainproofing. But in order to harvest this honey, the bees were, they had to be killed, usually with some sort of burning sulfur before the harvest. Skeps were used until about the 1800s until the popularity of the lumber and the abundance of lumber really allowed for them to keep bees in different ways. Um, and that was, uh, these are some examples of ways that they kept them after that. These are called gums. Um, they were hollowed out trees and the name came from, the name gum came from the use of black gum trees. Again, this was a pretty destructive practice to harvest the honey. They had to kill the bees to get it out. Um, sometimes they stacked logs on top of each other like cordwood to allow a lot of bees in one um, location. Other times they hung them from trees so that they could minimize the risk for predators. There are some similar structures to the skip that are used in Northern Africa still today. Um, they might use like clay pots or cylinders in those areas um, today. I was at um, K Cove in the Great Smoky Mountains, and they have an excellent display of gums used to keep bees um, at, in that area. So if you're ever in that area, it's kind of interesting to look at. So the typical hive we see today in the U.S. and most of the world is credited to this Philadelphia-born clergyman named Lorenzo Lorraine Langstroth, often L.L. Langstroth. He was... Um, thought to have this bipolar disorder and started keeping bees to calm his discomfort. And he was the first person to ever term this, this phenomenon that is called bee. That if a space was, a small space was left, less than one fourth of an inch, the bees were going to fill it with propolis. But on the other hand, when the larger space was left, more like three, four, three eighths of an inch, the bees filled it with comb. And this was really, this is going to become really important when we talk about size of our boxes. It has to be precise because bees are very precise on their sizes. So he used this discovery to make the frames um, re easily removable. That was another thing, like I said, that, um, you know, you couldn't remove the comb on those other styles of beekeeping so it made it really easy or really difficult to harvest the honey. So he developed these frames that were easy to remove. He first patented the hive in October of 1852 and a guy who was a beekeeper and a cabinet maker started making these hives for him. And the benefits to these hives is that the beekeeper could perform these rapid inspections without you know completely enraging bees. And they could also find the, the queens easier using those frames and there was no longer a need to destroy um, the hive for honey harvest. Either. So Langstroth died actually in Dayton, Ohio, which I find interesting. He's buried in Dayton, Ohio in Woodland Cemetery. He died in 1895. And so I like to talk about him just because he is considered the father of American beekeeping and he's right here in Ohio. So unfortunately, as most of those patents go early on, um, it was easily and widely infringed and he never received any royalties. So despite years of, of trying to defend the patent, he was really unsuccessful. Um, I get the question a lot, when, which hive is the best? And they all have different advantages, but they have to be managed properly. So I always recommend people starting with the Langstroth hive to train and begin to learn to management. If the design has been proven to be successful and is widely accepted. So if you have an interest in moving to another style in the future, you're going to have that experience working with the Langstroth hives to appreciate it really for its strengths and weaknesses. And so for this presentation, I'm really going to cover Langstroth hives because they are the most widely used. There are other different types. 
We're going to kind of start from the ground up in terms of hive components. So on the bottom, you're going to need a hive stand. They can be constructed out of wood, metal, cement. It has to be a material that is going to withstand weather. They can be as elaborate as this uh, faux brick house right here, this foundation. This would be considered the hive, um, the hive stand or it can be as simple as cement blocks that you can get for just a few dollars and really anything on that spectrum. We see kind of something you might typically see on the deck underneath. We have some metal frames. We have some all wood frames. Um, this one might be a little bit more challenging in Ohio because we're gonna, it's gonna be wet. It's gonna have snow on it. It's gonna rot. So you might have to consider that when you're um, taking, when you're, if you're gonna build it yourself or buy it. A lot of times beekeepers do become woodworkers or woodworkers become beekeepers. So um, that might kind of include some of you on the call today. Um, I run these cement blocks right here as my high stands. They're super cheap. They're really easy to move and they work for me. But anything is acceptable. So really we want to elevate the hive for protection for from weather, from um, predators, and because bending over a hive can be kind of bad on your back. So there are a number of predators I talked about, skunks, um, mice who like to crawl into and eat honey and snuggle in the warm hive during the winter. So to elevate them is one way to kind of manage that. Um, a box, you know, if we were just to put this box made of wood right on the ground in Ohio weather, we get rain, we get floods, we get snow, we get soggy soil, it's just gonna rot the bottom of your hive very quickly. Um, and there's also the temperature in the hive to consider. So a wet hive that has a wet bottom is going to lead to a lot of condensation in the hive, which could be deadly to bees in the middle of winter. And beekeeping, like I said, can be really hard on your back. These boxes get very heavy, you know, 40 to 80 pounds or more. So it's a little easier when they're not way down below your knees. Um, and the, also the elevation can help during the inspection process. So you're not hunched over looking at your hive. So the first type of bottom, the first type of bottom board is the ventilated or screened bottom board. This goes right on top of your hive stand. Um, there is a, the screened one, which is one here on the left. It is made um, of a hardware cloth bottom that's surrounded by wooden sides. And the second side, the second type is this solid bottom board, and it's made of just solid wood. Doesn't have any screen for ventilation. Both of these sit directly on the um, hive stand. It can also have this kind of sloping, um, either a sloping or a flat landing board it's called. This is where bees kind of actually do land on it and then walk into the hive. Um, it's completely your preference. Uh, the reason for the slope here is the thought that um, water and snow can then kind of just easily fall off. Whereas here, if your hive is not completely level, we could get some content or get some water in the hive that way. Um, maybe not in this screened bottom one, but if it were to have, if the, a flat bottom board with no screen, solid bottom board, it has a um, flat landing board, you might get some water in it. So that's for the reason for the differences there. It's completely your preference. Landing boards are actually not even necessary. A couple slides ago, there was a picture that didn't have a landing board. Um, some of the drawbacks to landing boards is it can allow for that snow accumulation, which could lead to blockage of the entrance or reduced air circulation. And they could be a perfect perch for mice. Um, but if you like to observe your bees, and um, many beekeepers do, you'll notice they're almost always land on the landing board on their return foraging flights. So you can easily observe the different colors of pollen they're bringing and watch them walk into the hive. Um, also, some interesting things come from the hive as well, and you'll, they'll end up on your landing board. This could be rejected pupa, bees with deformed wings. It might be easier to um, look at them. Um, you might see malformed bees or injured bees. Uh, without a landing board, these things often kind of go unnoticed. They drop straight to the ground and kind of lost this good opportunity to learn about your colony's health and activities. Bees also utilize landing boards during hot weather. They'll hang out on the board to cool down. I would say most beehives I've seen that are commercially available do have these landing boards. So they could either be, like I said, sloped or, um, or, or flat. Mine are all flat. I make sure that the hive is um, level and I also 
only run um, screen bottoms. But again, a highly debated topic <laughs> amongst um, beekeepers on the whether or not they should be solid or screened. Um, yes, uh, Corinna, the this one, um, the ventilated one, is more for warm weather and for. Um, so it's not necessarily that you change them out. That's definitely not the case. You don't change out your bottom board. So usually these vented ones, I have a picture here in just a second here. I'm gonna, I think I'll go to the next one. So this is an example of a ventilated bottom board, but it has this um, grid right here. So this is that grid I was talking about for counting varroa mites. It is inserted. It usually has this tract underneath um, the screen to insert. Um, so that you can collect for mites. This is another, the ventilated screen is also um, a protection against mites because when the mites um, fall down here, they don't, um, they can't go back up for whatever reason. But um, you can also, and you can track them down here and, and know what kind of infestation you might have. Oh, whoops. Sorry. Um, so mine are all ventilated, but they have this tract where I can push this bottom board in. And so that's what I do during the winter time. I push it in. And then also during uh, maybe like this time of year, I might only pull it like halfway out. So they have a little ventilation, but not too much. Um, and then for summer, I completely remove it. Um, so that, that's one way to kind of utilize these. I don't necessarily run a, um, a commercially available one like this. Mine are actually um, after the election when those nice um, those nice signs are available. I cut it to size and I can easily slide one of those in there. That's kind of what I we use for my um, my bottom boards under my screens. Um, somebody said that they'd heard that hives should be tilted slightly forward. It depends on the landing board. It can be. Um, so that's the idea that the water can run out if you get water on there from the landing board. So um, you can tilt them slightly forward, yes. And this recording, I'm hoping this will be available um, later. I'm hoping, <laughs> I, I'm trying. <laughs> so in this picture, you see this ventilated board. Um, this is that, like I said, that integrated pest management board. Sometimes it's sticky so that the mites, when they fall on it, they, they can't get away. Um, but that's how you calculate those mite loads by the, the dead ones. It also has, it's gonna have wax and pollen and propolis that falls on the ground. And that's another reason for these ventilated boards so that it falls out. And then I can pull this frame, this, um, this part out right here and clean it off and put it back in because otherwise you're gonna have this buildup of um, wax and wings and dead bees and pollen on those, um, and those solid ones, it's going to gather here, and that can lead to um, pest problems. It can lead to um, to scavengers like uh, wax moth and small hive beetles. Um, that that so you just have to be a manager of that. Other advantages of the screened bottom boards, like I said, was in the hot weather. Um, However, sometimes people say that the solid boards, they don't have, they think that it allows the queen to move more freely throughout the entire frame. Um, supposedly, their argument for that is that the screened ones, if it's like slightly too cold down toward the bottom, she won't lay at the bottom. I've not necessarily seen that on mine, um, but that is one thing that they, that they talk about, that beekeepers that uh, prefer the uh, solid boards. So one thing as we've been talking about these predators um, are entrance reducers or mouse guards. Um, they're, they come in a variety of uh, different um, materials. Um, they can be utilized during times of spring buildup or when you get a new package or a new nuke because they're kind of a little bit weak. They don't um, you know, have the resources or the, the numbers to kind of cover the whole entire deep um, box. So you, you kind of use, use this just to help your bees a little bit. So you could also be used on hives that are split into two, um, and just others that could, I, could really benefit from some additional protection. So reducers are used also during late summer or in times of high robbing incidents by yellow jackets. Yellow jackets will try to get into your, your hive and I've success seen, I've seen a bald faced hornet go to each of my hives trying to get in and she was, she or he, I'm not sure, was repelled each time by my hives. So it's kind of like a little bit of pride that my girls kind of fended them off, but I saw that that hornet go from, from hive to hive to hive. Um, 
these are also used in the winter months to reduce draft and to, to keep mice out that might be seek shelter. So um, here we have some inventive, um, maybe use for your wine corks. Um, here that you have me a metal one and there is a wooden one. So these wooden ones, you see two different openings. Here's a larger opening that you might have um, during spring, during when you have a nuke, when you have a, um, uh, just kind of a weekend hive time, you want to kind of protect the hive a little bit. And then this, when you turn it, um, it's only a tiny opening. And that's what you'd use during winter time because you, because a mouse could easily get into this probably very easily. But here, a little bit harder of time. So this is what you would use. You would kind of turn it down for, for winter time. Um, these are really inexpensive, just a couple dollars. Um, really, all these are. You could also use hardware cloth, but it has to be the right gauge to allow bees to get in and out. So that three eighths of an inch um, is helpful. And uh, that, that's another way to kind of manage that. It, I don't find that these is actually this one example is they're using the um, wooden one and the hardware cloth. I'm not really sure why, but um, to me, this would be a little bit harder to get off and, and kind of manage. And I, I prefer these right here. I've used these before. So on top of the bottom board, next we have our deeps. Um, so yes, Corinna, with the nuke, uh, with the nuke, you're going to use the mouse guard or the entrance reducer. Um, either one. I mean, you could use this one. You could you could use this one for a while, for a couple weeks, and as they start to build up, then move it to this one. Um, you can kind of use a combination. Somebody else also recommend if I um, or also asked if I recommended removing or cleaning solid board and bottom boards each season, or perhaps switching them out to a cleaned one. Um, that is probably a good idea. Like I said, I don't run solid bottom boards, um, but you it they're gonna get gunky and gross. Um, I don't even know if once a season would be sufficient. It might be even more often than that. Um, and as you can imagine, when you have, you know, a couple honey supers on, you have a couple deeps on, and then the bottom board, you're gonna have to take all those boxes off to get to the bottom to clean it off. Um, just something to consider. How are you going to manage that? These boxes are heavy. The more times you open it up, the worse it gets, you know, and, and not just the bees in the hive. If you stand in front of a hive, like directly in front of it where the, the hole is, you're going to get this swarm of bees at your back because they have GPS that shows them exactly where to go and you're, you're blocking their entrance. Um, so you never want to stand in front of your hive. Always stand to the side. Um, so when you take those boxes off and you're trying to busy trying to clean the bottom board, you're going to have this swarm of bees that are looking for their hive. So just just trying to kind of think about some of those things, and I just would recommend so that you um, can. I'm I'm always about uh, reducing the amount of times I get stung. I've been to the hospital once, and I hope that that's the only time I have to go. But um, I'm just kind of always thinking about that because, you know, this, this is kind of can be kind of dangerous, especially if you're real highly allergic. Um, just be just be cognizant of that. We want to kind of minimize any disturbance. So, OK, we got the bottom board. Then we're going to put a, um, a, a deep box on it. And depending upon the hive strength and the time of year, you're probably going to have two deeps. You're going to start with one and then put, a, put another deep on. The measurements of the deeps are extremely important in light of that bee phenomenon that I was talking about base. So this, these measurements that I have here on the board on the um, slide are extremely important. Don't make them too small. Don't make them too big. You're going to have problems. Make them exactly this length. Um, also for um, equipment compatibility, if you buy a nuke and your box is slightly too small or slightly too big, it's not going to fit right. So has to has to go on this. You can use various wood types. I have pine ones because they're cheap. I've got um, I bought some cedar ones just because that was the only ones that were available and I really needed some equipment. Um, I've not really noticed a whole lot of difference. Usually um, there you can find them painted. They don't have to be painted white. I think maybe the first beekeeper with Langstroth hives got a really good deal on white paint. So they started to paint them white. You don't have to. Mine are varieties of yellows and, and tans. Um, and they can be anywhere in between. 
Um, it's just easier to kind of see bees on, on white, so you can, um, if that's, that's a consideration there. So the measurements are really important. Um, they contain this kind of like lip, as you see right in here, that's what the frames sit on, on either side, some like this small shelf, the small lip. They also contain handles, or they can contain handles on the sides, and that's just easier to, for lifting. Some of them might have a one inch hole drilled about two thirds of the way up. So if this were the, if this were the front, um, it might be actually kind of right where that handle is, right about here. Um, and this is gonna be like an additional entrance for the hives and it adds some ventilation. Many boxes do not have this. Um, and the first boxes I had, they, um, they had it. I bought some new ones, they didn't have it. I thought that was weird. So we drilled some and then we found out that, you know, sometimes they just don't have it. So it's all kind of personal preference. There are some companies that are making these deep brood boxes and really the entire hive out of alternate materials, such as um, polypropylene hive. It's this like thermoplastic polymer that's used in packaging. It's kind of like an insulated type of hive. Um, just whatever your preference is, whatever you think is fine. Most of them are these wood boxes. Um, like I said, wood color doesn't matter. The paint doesn't matter. It's more of a protectant from the weather than anything else. Some people just like to varnish it or stain the bare wood. Other prefer, you know, a company logo or really elaborate decorations. It doesn't matter. One thing to consider is that maybe darker colors are going to make it more, um, or attract more sunlight and increase the hive temperature. And I think that's why most beekeepers go for a light or a white color. So inside each deep brood chamber are gonna be um, usually about 10 frames. There are some that run eight frames and just be aware of which ones you have. Um, eight frames are just a little bit lighter. So if you're a person that needs um, the, uh, you know, can't lift as much, maybe you might consider running eight frames instead of 10. Um, the frames are um, wooden on the edges usually and they have this pre-stamped beeswax um, in between. Some frames have this wiring, as you can see in this grid pattern that runs through the beeswax and it just provides some extra stability, especially if you're gonna use an extractor for honey. Um, but some of them don't have the, the wire. So it's really just your own personal um, preference. Be aware if you're ordering through a catalog or eBay or wherever that there are a lot of variations to frames. Some of them are sold assembled, meaning you have to put them all together. So make sure you look at your order closely. I'm not a woodworker and I don't have time to assemble extra frames. So I always buy them pre-assembled, even if it's cost a little more. Um, it just, it's what my preference. Some come without wire. Like I said, I recently bought some from eBay that uh, didn't have any wire. They were okay, but some of the ones that weren't wired in, some of the foundation kept coming out of the grooves on the bottom of the frame and it was really annoying. Be careful if you buy waxed right. This is kind of a misnomer. These are actually plastic frames that have a coat of wax on them. Be aware that that's what that means. Some people buy foundationless ones. I have a picture of that next that I'll show. Um, this, so these are some examples of some plastic frames. You see these are the smaller ones are for the honey supers. These larger ones are for the deeps. Um, on a personal note, like I accidentally bought some of these plastic frames, these waxed right, that's how I know the difference. Um, waxed right cell frames. I thought they were beeswax, but they were plastic that had, had that brush of wax on it. And I've been using them kind of in, interspersed amongst my beeswax frames. My bees will not use them. They are completely empty. They completely ignore them. They much prefer the beeswax frames. But, like I said, you're going to come across beekeepers who swear by plastic. And so there you have it. It's kind of clear as mud. I would just recommend whatever you use, maybe just keeping the same equipment. And that way your bees get used to whatever you have. Um, it's good. You do reuse these year after year. And like I said, you need to kind of um, consider marking the, the year on the top so that you know when you put them in. Um, Somebody asked if I use plastic foundation in wood frames. No, I have not. I, well, yes, I have actually. These plastic waxed right ones, they're a wood frame, but they're, th this part is plastic and then they have the wood frame. These, those are the ones that my bees won't touch. They're kind of a complete waste of money for me. They will not use them. So like I said, just 
if you're gonna run plastic, they're definitely a little bit more sturdy in the um, in the extractor. So if you if you want to run them, fine. But I just recommend running all the same kind. That way your bees don't develop a preference. They're just forced to use whatever you have. These are there. Some of them um, are sold with starter strips right here to kind of get them going. Um, and then some of them are foundationless. And if you're somebody who wants to sell comb honey, like uh, chunks of comb in your honey, this might be the way to go. Um, because you don't have wires, obviously, and you don't have that like um, that pre-stamped foundation. It's a little bit more um, na uh, natural way of selling it, I guess. Um, I've had, but this way right here, though, this is not going to withstand an extractor. It's going to crumble apart, and this one will too. Uh, but you can use another method of extraction called the crush extraction. Um, but obviously you're going to be crushing all your comb. And so keep in mind that it, it takes bees a lot of resources to build comb. So anytime you get rid of their comb, whether that be through, you know, the, this situation here or extractor, they got to start all over again. Um, I have had a couple of frames where the wire has come out or something in the extractor and have been able to um, utilize that to my advantage of selling, you know, combed honey when I didn't really intend to. Um, so just kind of one way I kind of mitigated that. Um, Heather asks, our first current only deep is foundationless. We'd like to switch to foundation when we add our second deep. Will this cause problems? It likely won't cause problems. I don't see if you're talking about brood being in a foundationless um, frame and they're using it, then it must be working for them. You're not going to put that in the extractor, so you um, shouldn't have any problems there. Um, I would I'd say it probably won't cause a problem, but behaved bees are usually somebody else. They're like children. They're usually somebody else's that follow that act like a book, you know. <laughs> Um, so I would say that I don't think you'll have a problem, but like I said, I'm always experimenting, always seeing what works. Um, sometimes it just doesn't go as planned, like I was saying, and they just make a huge mess of things. Uh, this is, um, again, unfortunately, one of my, um, examples that I had put, um, a foundationless one to kind of test it out and they came up with this mess. So giving them some ideas direction like you saw in that that first or the starter strip this is thought to kind of help reduce that likelihood of that situation so um uh you might consider using a starter strip if you don't want to end up something like this it just gives them a little bit of direction just to kind of minimize some of the chaos that might ensue so then after we have our two deeps right here, we have two deeps. We're gonna then talk about the mediums or the shallows or the supers. They go by many different names. Um, they're also 10 frames. They're three inches shorter. And these are usually used just for honey storage. Um, these are the boxes that you're gonna be removing for honey, for extracting honey. The picture on the left shows um, just this two hives. One has two deeps and the one has this honey super like it right here. Now, some keepers decide they only want to use um, one size of box, so they might use all shallows, they might use all deeps. And like I said, just realize that it's going to be um, really heavy to have all deeps. Um, and then instead of, if you go with these shallows as your brood boxes, you might need three of them instead of two of them. That just might be something to consider. Um, these pictured are, are here are mine. You see those entrance reducers right here with that little tiny hole. This is obviously fall or very early, very late winter, early spring. Um, and you see some of them have holes on them. Some of them I just cover with duct tape so that they don't spend their time propolicing it. Um, it's kind of whatever. Some This one doesn't have an entrance. I've got some of both, like I said. I just kind of want to take a moment to kind of recap the bee lingo because I don't want to lose anyone. Oftentimes these words are used interchangeably, but they mean the same thing. So I'm probably sure as I'm teaching here that I kind of use them um, uh, interchangeably. So deeps are brood boxes, they're brood chambers, they're deep supers, they're deep boxes. Supers are honey supers, mediums, or shallows is usually what you'll kind of hear. So next after you have um, whatever your top box is, if you're at the point where you have um, honey, a honey super on, you're going to have um, an inner cover, and they're going to look a couple different ways. 
Um, most of the ones that I have look something like this. They have this wood frame. They have a little hole that you would, this is upside down, um, that you would put on top to create this little ventilation hole, this entrance hole for your bees. This right here is for um, just a handhold. Sometimes they might have these circles. I have many of them that just have these circles because this is how I feed my bees. I'll talk about here a little bit later, but I need that for feeding. This one has, you see, four ventilation holes. I don't often see ones like that, just usually the one. And then some people run these like just a ventilated inner cover. They might, they probably feed a different way. Um, this is similar to what one of those propolis traps might look like I was talking about earlier, um, but just for ventilation. So these are some different ways that inner covers can look. Um, just you hear a lot about ventilation. That's because bees, even in the winter time, they can keep the hive at ninety, like ninety plus degrees. So ventilation is really critical at all times of the year. So even at the winter time, I'm not going to cover this hole up. You see, like I said, this was um, kind of some winter time right here. Uh, you see, the hole is still open right here. Okay, so then we're going to have a telescoping cover or an outer cover on um, the very top. This telescoping cover named is derived from the fact that it actually has sides that extend over the hive down a bit, kind of like telescoping it. So they're added on top of the inner cover. They're often covered with metal to add some durability and rainproofing to some extent. Um, they can be peaked or flat. The peaked options might have some ventilation holes drilled in them. Some flat telescoping covers might have notches, although mine don't. Um, I use a shim or more often than not a small stick to prop open the back here. I put it on top of the inner cover and then put the um, the telescoping cover on top to provide some ventilation, but I only do this during the warmer months. I don't do it during the winter time because I want to conserve that heat. Uh, one thing that's nice about the flat covers, it can be taken off and flipped upside down in the ground during inspection so that you can stack supers on top of them if, if you're looking, um, you know, at some of the bottom boxes. Uh, with those peaked ones, you're not going to be able to do that. You're going to need a different way. You don't want to put a super directly on the ground. It's going to, it's sticky. Everything's sticky. Everything's a mess in the hive. It's all sticky. So you're going to get grass and leaves and dirt on the bottom and you don't, a, you don't want that in your honey, and you just don't want it in your hive. Just you want to keep it things a little bit cleaner. Um, okay, so the next piece of equipment, these are, I consider this like optional equipment because it's, again, highly, um, highly debated among, amongst um, beekeepers, but I have experience running all these. So Queen excluders are set on the top of the second deep before you add your honey super. So they're constructed in a way that only worker bees and drones can pass through the opening. Queen bees are too long and plump to get through, and this prevents her from laying eggs in the honey super. They can be struck, constructed entirely of metal, like this middle one right here. They can be surrounded by a wood frame with a metal interior, or they can be made entirely of plastic. Um, I have each of these two really because that was all that was available at the conference that this exact conference that you guys would have went to um, a couple years ago I was buying some queen excluders and they, they didn't have enough. Um, my preference I feel like these wood ones fit a little bit better in my equipment they just per, they butt up against each other a little bit more seamlessly so um, they, just, they just have a tighter fit the these uh, metal ones they're tend you know kind of like warps and kind of it just doesn't fit as snugly. I decided not to buy the plastic kind, although they're, they're a lot cheaper, but um, I decided not to just, I maybe kind of anthropomorphize my uh, honeybees a little bit. I felt like it was really um, sharp. <laughs> so I was just worried about the sharpness of the plastic. Um, but these are just, the plastic was just a couple dollars. These are more like, like you know, 15 to $25, depending upon um, the supplier. But these um, grids are really rounded and I just felt like they were smoother and I like them a lot better. So, these queen excluders, though, is highly contested among beekeepers and their construction material preferences as well. I prefer to run hives with excluders on them because I've had queens that lay eggs in my honey super, and I, then I have developed larvae in my honey. Yuck. Nobody wants that. My clients don't want that. My, my customers don't want that in their honey, and you have to... Um, 
I had to basically cut that part out to extract the honey and then I was damaging the frames. So personally, I opted to use these other excluders or to use an excluder because I didn't want that in my honey. So um, like I said, beekeepers, they range the whole spectrum on whether or not to use these, um, but I just kind of come out on, I prefer to use them because I don't like the mess in my honey. Um, this is what I kind of consider must have inspection gear. A hive tool is essential. They come in a variety of lengths and a few different shapes and they're relatively inexpensive, usually under $15. I recommend you get two because I'm often misplacing mine and I don't ever want to do, it's, it's nearly impossible. I don't know how people do it without them. The hive bodies are usually stuck together with propolis during the summer months. And you have to use these tools to literally pry them apart. I mean, this is a very tough substance. You have to pry them apart. Um, you can use these to scrape um, wax or propolis off the frames. It helps the, this little J hook right here helps you kind of like hook the frame and pull it up for inspections. Um, I've used these to kill cockroaches in my hive or small hive beetles. Um, I find that they are very um, useful and that you usually sh should kind of consider getting two of them. Other, um, what I might consider must have inspection gear is also highly contested. Um, smokers, I like I said earlier, I do use a smoker. They have a little bit less variability than some of the other gear, but they do come in different sizes and that's really um, going to be dependent. It, it kind of speaks more to the length of time that you're doing the inspection. So they can be kind of a little bit smaller, maybe about um, 10 inches or so, maybe up to maybe 12 or 13 inches. Um, and that just allows a little bit more um, fuel to be in the body of the smoker to last longer, essentially. So larger for, for longer inspections. And then of course, you need a way to light your, your, your fuel inside the smoker. So I always keep one of these or a couple of these handy. Um, I've seen some homemade smokers, very interesting. So there's some very um, uh, inter people that have a lot of creativity out there. Um, and then you'll need some smoker fuel. And this is about as uh, the options are kind of endless. Uh, people use rolled cardboard that uses, um, that uses uh, a lot of, or can produce a lot of smoke. People use burlap, people use um, cotton, you can use baling twine if that's accessible to you. Um, pieces of discarded um, t-shirts or old t-shirts, cotton essentially. Um, and then they also, you can buy these kind of wood pellets um, for uh, smoke as well. So the idea is just to get, get something burning, get something that's gonna smoke for a while because you don't want flames and you don't want it to be hot. So you want something that's gonna produce a cool smoke. So these are, I, I've pretty much tried all of these options. Um, I have a ha huge bag of these. I really like rolled card cardboard. It tends to kind of work well. I've used the cotton before. Like I said, I'm always experimenting and I'm always trying to see what works best. There's some other things that you might make your job a tad bit easier, but are certainly not required. Um, first, a cap scratcher. That's this one right here. It's used mainly for uncapping honey be suspected of disease, like we talked about in the last session, American foul brood disease, or if you're checking for mites or something, that could be something that you might um, want to consider. Um, a bee brush right here is really handy to remove bees from areas that you're trying to lift or trying to get a closer look at. Um, however, again, many beekeepers don't like to use them because they say that makes the bees really mad and brushing tends to kind of kind of send them rolling, so they don't really like that. Um, other beekeepers utilize a spray bottle of a one-to-one -one ratio of sugar water to lightly mist bees during inspections. I don't recommend doing this when it is like a little bit cooler, but during the hot summer months, what it does is it, it kind of coats them all in sugar water and it kind of distracts them. They're all busy trying to groom each other um, and they uh, are kind of less worried about what you're doing. This is a tactic to kind of keep them occupied basically. Um, there's some people out there that use essential oils like clove oil that's purportedly um, or reportedly disliked by bees and kind of discourage somebody, some of them, some people put that on their hands or their gloves to kind of discourage bees from getting near um, us in inspection as a beekeeper. Uh, this is one I've tried. I'm not really sure if I've had success or not. Still get bees on me. Um, 
a notebook or a pen is kind of um, pretty essential to a good beekeeper, just a way to kind of keep notes, um, unless you have an exceptional memory. And I really consider myself to have pretty good memory, but when you're looking at six hives, by the time you get to number five, you're like, I don't remember, was that was that queen in hive number two or number one? You know, it, it just becomes too difficult because they all kind of look the same. But what this is nice to do is that it can record, you can record your honey production of each hive so you can kind of gauge how they're doing. You might think you have a good memory, but like I said, it can kind of get a little confusing. If you, um, like I said though, propolis and, and, and honey gets on your hand. So pen and paper, traditional pen and paper might be a little bit too difficult to um, uh, use. You might have to use something like your cell phone, um, you know, maybe taking a break in between hives um, to kind of record some notes. And there's some apps actually out there that can help you do that. Um, I also bring my cell phone down for safety reasons. My um, hi, my bee yard is a good ways from the house, and I'm usually either down there by myself or my sister and I are by myself. So if you need to call for help, you need you need a phone. Um, also, I like to take pictures of my bees. I share our progress on our Facebook page. Um, for our customers and people enjoy that. So that's another good um, tool in your toolbox. Um, and so one of the um, the apps that I was talking about, there's one called Hive Tracks and it's spelled H-I-V-E-T-R-A-X. You can download and you can put inspection information right into it. It's really cool. You can have, you build your hive, you put in how long your queen's been um, uh, alive. You, you can track a ton of different stuff. It's really cool. And I'm sure there are others out there. I just haven't got to all of them. There's so many apps out there. And then also we bring down um, some sort of jars or containers. Um, I, I, this is one of my favorite food groups is coffee. So I have a ton of coffee um, containers around at my disposal. So I keep two, one for um, propolis scrapings and one for bee wax, bees, extra beeswax, because they're always put in bur, which, what's considered burr comb, which is comb that they're really not using so much. They put it everywhere. They put it on the inner cover. They put it on your the top of your frames. And so I just like to keep it a little clean. I scrape it off. I put it in the container and then... Um, I have a number of, um, you know, people that often ask me for my beeswax if I have any. People are interested in its um, water repellent uh, capabilities. It, they're interested in um, using it. I have some some family members that do woodworking. They like it. Things like that. So people are always asking for that. Um, and if you want to make other products out of it, it it's a good way to just kind of collect as you go. So some sort of jar. I've used either coffee cans. I've used you know, mason jars, doesn't matter. And then but with the wax, so if you're gonna save the wax, make sure you put it in the freezer because it has a potential to turn into wax or have wax moth develop on it. So make sure you keep it in the freezer. Um, propolis, doesn't matter so much. Uh, we have not done really anything with our propolis, but um, my sister was interested in in making some stuff out of it. So I don't know if we'll get to that or not, but um, you can gather them, you can turn them into products to either sell, sell or um, to keep for yourself. Uh, there are some other rules about selling that, though, if you get into those sorts of things, because those are value-added products, and they um, are different. So let's talk about personal protective equipment, um, how you need to suit up. Uh, these are usually made of cotton or a fabric blends. Uh, nylon is generally too hot. However, some do have ventilation um, panels that you'll see built into them to, to help with that. Um, the bee suits are typically white. They're not like gray. This picture kind of looks gray, but they're usually white. And they're really white um, just because it's, it's going to try to keep you ideally a little bit cooler on those hot summer days when you're doing those. And it's easier to spot a hitchhiker when you're on your arm. That if you had a dark fabric on, that's going to, um, you can't really see them e as easy. So they usually have some sort of zippered enclosure. They have this veil right here. Um, th they might have a hat on them. They have, some of them have thumb loops or elastic closures. They come as jackets. They come as full body suits. Um, me personally, we went with the full body suit. They're more, they can be more expensive. Although I don't think there's a whole lot of difference between the jacket and the maybe just like about $15. So I prefer the whole suit. Um, it keeps me, keeps my clothes clean and it just makes me a little bit more protected. We um, kept bees for a number of months and just had a veil because that's the way he, we had seen our mentor do it. And it took hours because we were constantly running from bees, <laughs> constantly getting stung. And so we just realized, you know, 
just for our peace of mind and not get stung, um, we, we like these a lot, lot better. Now you can get stung through these suits. They're not 100%, um, but it definitely helps protect you. We have a number of different veils and hats that can be, um, th that are options, and you'll just have to find one that you really like. Um, from personal experience, know that the ones on the left right here, these ones right here, they don't always come with the helmet part. Sometimes it's just the veil. I made this mistake. Uh, it's often a separate item that you have to purchase. Now, the other two on the right-hand side are one piece. They're kind of a hat veil combinations, um, with the exception of this one right here. But these two right here, I run one that kind of looks like this. Um, the white helmets don't really fit me well, especially if I'm wearing a ponytail. I have long hair. Um, they they just rock off my head, and I've been having my time like trying to get the thing situated on my head. I also don't like, I'm kind of short, I don't like this bunching right here. Um, some of that netting is like can lay directly on your neck, and bees can sting through that. And this is how I ended up at the hospital, is I had about I stopped counting after 28 bee stings on my because that that fabric was laying against my neck because it was just bunched up and so I went to one of these where it's not on my neck anymore. That's just my own personal preference. Um, the two on the left right here, these are part of the suit itself. So they, they zip onto it. This one is just has kind of like this drawstring enclosure. So it actually is though part of it. You can see the zipper really nicely right there. This one keeps it away from his neck a little bit more, but this one, that's what I started with. I'll never go back to that. Um, I, I much prefer these kind of outer ones just because of my experience. Many beekeeping magazines and sites sell gloves as well. And again, there are many different types and different options. Um, most of them are some sort of leather co canvas combinations. The ones on the top right are leather gloves with this canvas kind of ventilation um, built into it. This adds some protection. Um, the canvas has protections to your arms. It goes over top of your suit and um, it has a screen to ideally keep you a little bit during summertime. It, it can get quite hot. Um, the ones on the bottom left are just regular like goat skin gloves and you can pretty much get those anywhere, but just be aware that, you know, your, your um, wrists are going to have some potential. If you're, you can put maybe a rubber band around them, that might help on top of your, um, put it on the outside of your uh, bee suit or on the inside, whichever kind of depends upon what you're working with. You can also use rubber gloves, like the ones on the right, the top ones are a little thicker, provide a little bit more protection. The ones on the bottom are just like those cheapy, dis indis or really inexpensive, disposable, almost type gloves. Um, just remember these get really hot in the summertime and um, your, your hands work up quite the sweat. So the reason for these, they're kind of inexpensive. You can, they're, they're your gloves get really propolis. You can kind of throw them away. Um, whereas these over here on this side are, you know, you know, they're going to run you somewhere between twenty and thirty dollars, and they're still going to get gummy, and you can't really wash propolis or honey necessarily out of leather. So um, just kind of be aware. You might you might be buying gloves, you know, once a season. Um, so just kind of something to think about. Then we come to feeding. That is um, other equipment that is really not needed for keeping bees, but the, oh, I'm sorry, but not feed, this is not feeding. This is, um, this is not required, but these are other things that you might see. So I talked about um, propolis traps. That is this one over here. This is kind of like that ice cube type thing where you, you use this. It's a particular size. It's that less than a fourth of an inch. So they're going to fill it with propolis. You're going to put that in the freezer. You're going to crack it like an old, old fashioned ice cube tray and extract that propolis to be able to use on different things to make different products. Um, this is a pollen, um, a pollen screen which the, uh, it's utilized so that um, it's kind of kind of similar to a queen excluder. The holes are e even too small for worker bees to squeeze through with their pollen baskets full. So they squeeze through them and um, the pollen, pollen falls off into a tray and you can, you need to empty the tray daily because it can mold. So you empty the tray and then you dry it down um, and it can be sold to the public um, that way. Or, uh, if you go to a health food store, you might see um, pollen um, in little containers that you could buy um, because it has so many vitamins. It's kind of considered like a health food. 
Um, it has lots of vitamins and minerals in it that are considered, you know, by some healthy to, for you. Um, people put it on their oatmeal. They put it on their yogurt, granola. Um, my sister tried this a little bit, and she noticed after a couple of days her throat was really itchy. And she realized that something, some sort of pollen source she was allergic to. So be aware that if you have allergies of flowers or, or bee or trees or, um, or weeds or something like that, that this does kind of transfer to the pollen. So then we get to feeding. At some time or another, you might choose to or need to feed your bees. So we're going to cover some of the options uh, and some of the pros and cons. I'm not going to cover exact syrup mixes. I can at the end, maybe, if you would like to. There's kind of a whole other discussion. Um, but there are a few common setups in terms of feeders. And just knowing which one you're going to utilize um, kind of decides uh, what uh, kind of equipment you're going to use. So one really easy one is the, board, uh, the Boardman feeder. It's an easy setup. <laughs> It's just this little piece of um, wood here that is kind of made dual layers here. It could maybe have some metal on it for a little bit of um, weather withstandability. So the idea is the bees crawl in under here. You put a mason jar filled with um, your sugar water, your feed on top, and you have these little holes in the bottom. And it's because it's inverted and those holes, it kind of suspends it enough that the bees kind of like lick it and are able to get it. It doesn't just, you have to make the hole small enough that it just doesn't pour out. Um, but that is one way to feed them. It's really easy as a beekeeper. You don't have to open the hive. You just kind of insert it into the front there. Um, the cons are that, you know, you can only put a quart or a pint in at a time. So a limited um, amount of feed, you might have to replace this frequently. It can encourage some robbing. So if you don't have it kind of um, shut up like this, you might have some other the other neighbor bees looking for some easy food. And it's far from the clusters. This is not really a way that you can feed when it's um, colder outside. Um, times like this where we kind of have a little bit colder nights and, and warmer days. Um, this is not really a, well, maybe for now, but in the winter time, it's definitely not a way we want to do it. First of all, it has the, the um, liquid, it's going to freeze. But anytime that they're in a cluster, they're going to be far away. It's going to take a while to get there, and they might end up literally starving or dying before they get there. So not really good for that. Um, then there are other kinds that are like in, they're considered in-hive or division board feeding. And um, these are like dropped in in the place of a frame. Um, they're easy to refill, but you can also do some spills, and you can maybe have some problems with drowning. Bees are not really great at, they can't like hover and, and, and drink. They have to have some somewhere to land to be able to drink. Um, but you can situate these easily near the cluster during the colder months. Um, but then when you, if you're gonna have to refill them during the colder months, it's gonna put stress on them. And during the hot months, it might also entice robbing situations. And then, like I said, they don't have any place to stand, um, so they might drown. So maybe consider putting some folded um, hardware cloth in it for a foothold. These are really inexpensive. They're usually only about 6 to $10, depending upon the source. Another super simple way is a simple plastic bag that uh, is just filled with the sugar water. It can be located right on top of the cluster during the colder months, although liquid, again, is kind of a problem during colder months, so you don't usually feed liquid. But... Um, you fill the bag with your feed, you seal it, you poke holes with a tiny little straight pin to make it accessible. Um, you can even put some duct tape on the top to kind of prevent ripping of the bag and it's laid directly on the frames and topped with an extra super um, for that. So that, that's another option. This is um, like a pail with a perforated lid and it works just like the, um, just like that inverted uh, mason jar of the Boardman feeder. Um, and it's closer to the cluster. You can obviously put um, a larger capacity of feed in there. It doesn't need refilled as often, um, but you have to have an extra super to enclose it, oftentimes a deep. Me, I run something similar to this, only I run, I remember I said I use those inner covers with the hole in the top, and that, I said that's where I put my feed. I invert a pint jar into it, and it sits right on top of the, the frame there. Um, just similar to this, this setup right here. And um, I just refill them, I switch them out, but then I have to put a honey super um, around it so that I can cover it up like that. Um, it's important never to feed while you're 
while you have your honey supers on it, you can't feed and be collecting honey at the same time. So these are times when you're, you're not collecting the honey, otherwise you're gonna get contamination. Um, so that's something to um, consider also. So, okay, so I'm gonna go back and answer questions. I think that's all that I kind of have um, for today and I'll be happy to answer some questions now. So somebody asked um, that they're getting a nuke that has waxed, but they prefer to use wax ones. Should we finish the base deep brewed box with wax right and then go for wax for the rest of the box? Huh, good question. Um, like I said, I try to keep the same as possible. Um, so you can do a couple of things. You can either use the waxed right ones and put wax ones in and see what they do. They might have a different temperament than my bees did. Maybe they'll utilize them, maybe they won't. Um, then with that, you can kind of like go back and um, replace, kind of replace them when they stop um, 